Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. and welcome back to the fourth trimester podcast. I'm here with Marissa Belcher, who is the co-author and editor and writer of a book that we've talked about before, which is the first 40 days, the essential art of nourishing the new mother. And we're such a big fan of the book and all of the authors. We've invited Marissa to come and be on our program. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of our Patreon sponsors. Um, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the podcast, we would highly value that. Um, just go to patreon.com. Also, please go to our website, which is Fourth Trimester Podcast, and sign up for our newsletter so that you can hear more from us. So in addition to uh, working on the book that we love so much, um, Marissa has co-authored and authored and edited numerous publications. Um, she's worked with HarperCollins, Abrams, Simon & Schuster, Rodale, the list goes on. Um, she's had work appearing in numerous magazines and websites, and she's helped many other authors. And her area of expertise is wellness, self-improvement, pregnancy, parenting, everything we want to talk about. So that's absolutely perfect. And she is an ex-Brooklynite who now resides in Berkeley, California with her two young sons. So welcome, Marissa. Thank you, Sarah. So happy to be here. Yeah. Um, so to kick off, would you be willing to share a little bit about your own fourth trimester experience? Sure. Um, for me, there's uh, no way I can really talk about my fourth trimester experiences without bringing in the fact that I have two children because they were so starkly different. And I guess I'll just jump in and say that my, my first, when my first son was born, I was deeply immersed in the belief that I had to do it all and that in doing it all, I would receive some superhuman badge of honor. And um, I think it was timing or age or luck or circumstances. I actually did to some degree, pull off doing quote it all, which is continue sort of working as a freelance writer and keeping my relationship afloat and, and juggling a newborn. But when his brother was born five years later, I was um, attempted to do the same thing, but this time with a, with an older child as well. And was quickly, I guess I want to say humbled by the intensity of trying to recover from pregnancy and birth and tend to a newborn and keep my life going as it was before. And I, I actually got very sick and it was, that was the starting off point for me wanting to do this work in, in the postpartum care space. It really inspired me um, to want to make sure that other, other women don't have to go through what I went through and understanding that it's, it's really important to, to give yourself a period of focused care and attention to whatever degree possible. How did you cope with your sickness? What happened? Yeah. So I, I had sort of the, the seeds of, I guess the of pretty bad flu that was going through New York city at the time when I was nine months pregnant. And it's so amazing how the body works, but it's almost like I was able to push pause on the progression of that sickness when I went into labor and and gave birth to to my younger son. It's like the pause button clicked on. I focused on labor, felt healthy and strong and able to do so. And then almost the minute the adrenaline from birth wore off, I was I was sort of hit with this pretty strong Flu, and then instead of tending to it and, and paying attention, like I said, I just really barreled through my life 
um, you know, picking my, my older son up from school with a newborn strapped to my chest. I mean, really not paying attention. So what ended up happening, which I really, I do love the body for this is that the body, my body made the decision for me. And I was actually, <laughs> right. I had no mm-hmm. choice, to, but to slow down. Um, I ha- mm-hmm. And I asked for help. I had to ask for help um, in the, in the deepest way possible. I was really fortunate to have um, my mother nearby. So I asked for help from, from her to um, the extent that she could give it. I had uh, my, my baby's father was with us as well, but he was working full time. So friends, neighbors, truly, like I had people taking the baby out of my hands to, to, to rock him and lull him to sleep. Any, any place where I could try to catch um, little pockets of sleep, which a, which a mother needs anyway in those early days after birth. But for me, because of the illness, it was even more important. So I was actually forced to, to slow down, which, which I respect, you know, in, in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think rest is what the body needs, even when we aren't sick after giving birth. A hundred percent. Yes. And so how would you contrast that to your, to the birth of your first son? So, um, the, fir- the birth of my first son, I almost feel like I kind of got away with it. <laughs> like I said, it really, like I just was, I had no idea, I want to stress this too, uh, with both both of my children, zero idea um, about all this this wonderful information that we have in our book and this whole concept of, of postpartum care and mm-hmm. a dedicated period of rest and recovery. I, I had never heard of that before. So I, I was... I always use myself as the sort of the what not to do example when I speak to expecting mothers and whatnot. So my, my first son, I, I think it was just the, I was able to keep all the, all those balls in the air. And, and I felt myself feeling proud. I remember, mm-hmm. I remember strapping my, my firstborn onto my chest in a Brooklyn winter, you know, and I would, <laughs> if, if, if there wasn't such a lesson embedded in this, I, I would be embarrassed now but I strapped him to my chest. He was a week old and I walked in the winter to a friend's house, um, several blocks away. And I remember thinking, wow, you're, you're tough girl. Like you can do anything. Right. And now I understand I would never do that ever to myself or to the baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I had it to do again, we have a lot of listeners who um, maybe haven't had their first birth experience yet. Like, I'm just going to ask the simple questions. Like, why? Why wouldn't you do that again? Yes, right, right. No, thank you. And it's, I, I had no idea at that time either because those, <laughs> those, those early days and weeks after giving birth mm-hmm. are are an are an incredibly tender period of of entry into the world for the baby, mm-hmm. where the baby is is adjusting to to the absolute sort of bombardment of sights and sounds and um, everything after being in the womb for nine months. It's a really delicate period of adjustment for the baby. And it's also an extremely delicate and important period of adjustment for the mother, especially for brand new mothers, as you transition from from an old way of, of living your old life before you were a mother and also physiologically and emotionally, your body is going through a massive transition as your hormones um, readjust and your, your body um, tries to find its equilibrium again. And so it's very, very encouraged to, to give yourself the time to rest, recover and heal. And this is information that I did not have at that time. We've had a past guest come on the show and say that when she had her first baby, she felt like a pioneer woman that, you know, pioneer women survived out on the trail. I can do this. I can do it too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she was, an, she had this mentality of survivorship. So do you think your, your former self would have identified with that? Very much, very, very much, you know, mm-hmm. survivorship, superhero, um, super woman do, uh, doing it all, quote it all thinking that that, that, that was the, the right way to handle things um, is a very, very common perspective. Really, mm-hmm. really understandable. A lot of us think that. You know, and I wonder if here in the United States, there is one model that women have for postpartum. I mean, for the most part of my personal experience, I, I see women 
um, kind of just making it up as they go along or like maybe subscribing to one or two books that they read, but really mostly looking to find pride in the, oh, my body bounced back. I bounce back. I'm fine. I can do everything. So, and and some I, I don't know where this expectation is coming from, but it seems like there's a lack of a different way or a different uh, a different guide for women. Like, I just wonder yeah. why that is or what, why, if that's true for, if, if that's just by experience. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I agree with you a hundred percent and all, all of the thinking along those lines added up to, to, to help us with the motivation to write this book. Um, so my, my co-authors who, you know, Han and Emily and I are all, all working mothers and we have six kids between us and we, um, we really experienced that that firsthand, that sort of unspoken pressure societally to, to bounce back and, and just the concept of bouncing back now that we're, now that we're so, so immersed in, in this concept of postpartum care and attention, uh, we, I'm just so amazed that women are expected to go back. Just even the idea, right? There is no back. There's really, there's only through. So in our book too, we encourage women so so much to 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 let go, if you will, like if you're holding on to the old way. And this can be applied to everything. And this might be a nice segue whenever you're ready to relationships, but like holding yes. on right to how it looked before, and that is your body, your social life, your relationship, uh, even your philosophy, your perspective on life, your value system, even all radically shifts when once your baby arrives. And I think staying open, like if I could do it again, I would have, I would have loved to have given myself the space to stay open to whatever it was transforming into, you know, yeah. and there's, there's some unknown there that you're going to have to trust is going to, I love work out. that. I'm going to quote you. I know it. It's so good. <laughs> I love what you said that there's no back there's through. There's through. And that is a perfect segue. We wanted to focus today on relationships. Um, and I, I think kind of the point that you're making in general applies, um, although we are going to deep dive, but just that, you know, when we when we have a baby, our lives change, our bodies change, everything changes. And I think maybe let's talk about relationships specifically as well. But like, <laughs> what's the benefit of, of preparing yourself for, for that change beforehand? Uh, well, it, it, there's immense benefit, uh, we believe, uh, very much just as you, you prepare your, your mind, your heart, you know, your body, your home for mm -hmm. the arrival of your baby, your relationship requires similar attention. Uh, we call it fortifying your relationship in our book, which I really, really like. I like the idea of, of, you know, adding in sort of reinforcements for this, this uncertain territory and time that you're about to embark on together. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of exciting to know that there are, there are ways of doing that. Yeah. Um, when people are, when two people decide that they're ready to enter parenthood, um, what are some things that they could start to think about beforehand? Well, so many, um, but it seems like the, the first thing to really sort of wrap your mind around and, and your, your heart around is the fact that your relationship will change. Um, I don't like to use absolutes. I definitely tend to, to sort of dance around them because everybody's experience is different. And I can confidently say it will change. It's absolutely inevitable. Before baby's arrival, you, you and your partner were, were this island, where it was just the two of you and you were able to focus your, your attention and your energy and, you know, your forward thinking around each other. And now not only is there another human being, you know, in your, what has been this really special duo, but it's the most needy demanding in a way um, creature too, that comes into your life. So it's, it's, it's absolutely shifts. So I think the first step is understanding that your relationship will change and beginning to get comfortable with that idea. And then from there, there's an understanding that yes, it, it will change. And it's not all, all going to be challenging. There's some incredible, incredibly beautiful things that are going to happen too. 
I like to really make sure that we we look at the balance that's taking place as well. So um, and we can go into more detail if you'd like about all the things that are going to change. But uh, I think the first thing to remember is it's going to change. And on the positive note, what's going to happen is there's going to be this increased intimacy where it was just two. Now you're now you're your family and you're sharing this incredible love that you have for your baby with someone else who gets it like you do. And there's an incredible sort of warmth and intimacy that's born from that bond and connection. I think that's really important to remember and to turn to when, when times feel challenging. And then there are all the, there are all the other places that can get rocked by the baby. And well, I mean, just one thing that comes to mind is, as an example, I know that a lot of people before they get married, they go through like they have there's this own set of expectations about a relationship milestone like getting married. You know, a lot of people go to counseling either like with a with a church person or just like a therapist or like whatever, you know, or maybe it's just people, you know, wise people from the family, you know, like sitting down talking with a couple like about how, you know, what what this milestone means and how it's going to impact their relationship. <laughs> and I and I, you know, I, I think there's probably a, a, a huge amount of value in maybe going through the same process before one has a baby. I mean, it doesn't need to be anything formal, but just at least giving the giving the whole the milestone because it is such a huge milestone in anyone's life having a baby. Um, but just giving it the same kind of thoughtfulness and consideration about how that's going to change. Um, but I think it's a little less common, like maybe. Maybe people have the the like the fairy tale dream idea that like oh we're gonna have this baby and it's gonna we're gonna you know get all get all of these good things these benefits out of it but perhaps not fully considering and I'm not saying that like oh it's all doom and gloom but just not considering some of the other pieces as well. I love what you're saying and, and this this is another you know piece of the conversation the conversation that we're having now and that I hope that we're all going to be having in, in greater detail and on an ongoing basis. Um, it's a, it's a, having a baby is a, is a huge thing on every level and simply acknowledging that like bringing awareness and attention to that has great impact. And again, n- not at all to be, to be gloom and doom, but to be realistic. I mean, studies say that two thirds of couples experience a significant negative shift in their relationship within three years of having a child. So hmm. what can you do you know, to cut that off at the pass, you know, and to circle back to what you said. Yes. I don't, I don't necessarily think you need to bring in an outside person. It's, it's, it's absolutely fine and encouraged if that feels good to you, but we also feel that you can have them one-on-one with your partner before the baby arrives. And before is really, really the key word because once, once the baby arrives, right. It's, it's very hard to bring your attention to these things. Oh so yeah. Busy. Oh and energy levels are different and hormones are all over the place. Oh. But what, um, so I do have a question for you though. Like when you talk about before baby arrives, do you mean before you're pregnant or before you sign the adoption papers or what? Or do you mean like during the pregnancy, just like at least before the baby's born? Great question. I, I don't, I don't think there's, there's a particularly right time in our book. Uh, we, we base, the majority of our book, the first 40 days is about the preparation period because ha- just having been mothers or being mothers ourselves and going through that newborn period, we just know that basically all bets are off, right? When you're in those early weeks of the baby, it's just full on sometimes survival mode as you, as you tend to the baby and you heal and rest and recover and, and tend to all these other changes in your life. So for mm-hmm. us, even the third trimester is absolutely fine. You know, during pregnancy, third trimester, just be able to sit down with your partner, just pulling, pulling, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to just sit across the table from each other on the couch with each other and actually have a a dedicated conversation about what it possibly will look like. And most importantly, I think what the expectations from each of you are about what this period is going to be. To me, that's Mm -hmm. so key to get to get each party's expectations onto the table. So you both can have a really nice, clear look at them and then be able to say, oh, wow, I had no idea that you were expecting to um, have help, have some paid help uh, tending to the baby while I was at work, the partner might feel. Or I had no idea that you were hoping that I would take two weeks off from work. You know, I'm I'm not able to do that. Or I am. 
it's really good to hear that that's what you're looking for. You know, being able to put that on the table is so important. Mm -hmm. What questions would people start with? Um, So we have, uh, we have outlined, we call them four relationship saving questions to ask before baby arrives. And they, they simply are one, how will we divvy up baby caring responsibilities? Two, how will our finances be influenced by baby's arrival? Um, three, how will our sex life be affected by the addition of a newborn? And four, how will our social lives change once baby is here? Let's go through each one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Um Okay, so number one, this will bring us back to what we were just speaking about, sort of the expectations. How will we divvy up baby caring responsibilities? So for us, and I say us, I mean my lovely co-authors and I, we, because we just, as a little sidebar, as we were writing this book, we kept checking each other. We were each other's sort of checkpoints for, hey, is this, does this sound, is this useful? Is this what, is this what we would have wanted during our third trimesters or postpartum periods? Is this, is this filling a gap that was sort of empty and echoing when we were going through the same thing? So this is how all this information came to be. It was just this sort of the three of us really checking each other like that. And so for us, we thought a good place to start would to be, would be to understand sort of the biological imperatives that a new mother and a, a partner are contending with when a baby arrives just sort of the innate differences there. And if you look at that, um, you'll see that a woman, a new mother is really programmed to, to nurture and nourish, right? Sort of inward uh, activities and processes that really have to do with um, tending and caring and um, soothing, right? And then partner usually and historically has, has a desire to, to keep that sort of keep the nest afloat, whether that means supporting through, through work financially, um, through making sure that the mother and baby have what they need. There's a bit of a sort of external caretaking situation going on. And so just understanding that that's biologically generally how things are unfolding was kind of a good first step. So that said, this might help a partner understand, ah, okay, she's not, you know, my, my, my spouse or, or partner hasn't even looked me in the eye in this first week when, since baby's arrived. Like she's absolutely consumed with getting the baby to sleep, getting the baby to latch, com- combating diaper rash, whatever it is, you know, is this unbelievable sort of my, myopic focus going to shift, you know, understanding that she's motivated by something bigger can help. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's number one. Oh, wait. So that's, that's the basis uh, for number one, which is understanding first what we're, what we're doing biologically. And then, okay, from there, how will we divvy up the responsibilities? And that brings us back to that conversation that hopefully you had before the baby arrived, which is, okay, so we, there's going to be outside help, whether it's, uh, um, in-laws, the, the mother's mother, a postpartum doula, whatever, whatever that that outside care is, it's agreed upon before the baby arrives. So everybody understands what's happening. Right. And if, if the couple um, doesn't necessarily know what's the right thing, maybe they could talk with their friends, get, you know, listen to their friends experiences or um, ask family members what their experiences were like, and maybe embark on that. um, Like it might be nice for the relationship to embark on that research together and come to the conclusion together about what's right. Yeah. I really like that idea. And I think that um, again, giving yourself time. So having these discussions significantly before your due date, I think will really would give you the space to, to be able to explore together not feeling mm-hmm. so pressured. Mm-hmm. Right. And I really, I like the, I like the openness of the conversation beforehand and your point about expectations, because if there's one person who has the expectation that like, okay, you're the nurturer, you're the baby person, I'm the worker. So that's your department. This is mine. So you'll be fine. You know, if there's that expectation on one side and then on the other side, it's, well, 
I expect you to be there to take out the trash and make me food and take care of me while I'm recovering, then, you know, that that potential for misalignment is very real. Um, and that could be really hard for a couple to deal with. 100%. And, and again, cutting that off, you know, before, cutting it off the past before your baby arrives and, and sort of the stakes are higher is a really wonderful relationship, I say, saving technique. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because as you said, once baby arrives, it's like it's just full on baby in recovery mode. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a difficult time to have an not an argument, but just like have any element of conflict or, or negativity. It's just like that zone when when you're at home with baby is pure love. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's pure tiredness and pure love and um creating the space and alignment between you and, and your partner um, or your caregivers, just whoever's there with you, um, you know, beforehand so that you can enjoy it is wonderful. Yeah, that's so such a good point. And I think that having, whether it's conflict or just, just difficult conversations, right? Having them mm -hmm. when a baby has arrived and, and is in your arms is decidedly more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, and it feels a little more pressured, like, ooh, my needs aren't getting met, and that's that's harder. It's a lot harder. Absolutely, and then you're almost racing to catch up. Like, ooh, okay, we didn't realize that. We really need, the two of us, the way our lives are shaped, right? We, mm -hmm. we need some extra help, but we didn't arrange it. So now, of course it's possible, right? But now we're scrambling to do that and, and with mm -hmm. the baby here. So it's just it's just more challenging. Okay, so then number two is a big one. And again, not exactly a, a sexy topic, but incredibly important, which is how will our finances be influenced by baby's arrival? Um, and I really like this, this side note, this includes the time, if any, that the mother will be taking off from work and any professionals that will be hired to help, like we just discussed. Mm -hmm. I am a lover of spreadsheets. <laughs> yes. Nice. Uh, I love spreadsheets. I love forecasting and planning. Um, I, I do it professionally. I do it at home in my household. Um, I know that's not the case for everyone, um, but I, I like the visibility and the openness and um, kind of the predictability of all of that. Um, so I, I enjoyed sort of geeking out on my plan and the financial side of my own pregnancy and um, maternity leave. What are, you know, if money is an awkward situation for any couple, um, how, what are the... What are the openers there? How does this how does this get addressed? Like some people have finances combined, some people don't. Hey fellow parents, can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family, and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memory secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the Family Album Map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the app store today, search family album, one word, download the app and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. Well, for me, yes, this is, there, there's so many, so many different scenarios and every, every couple and family is different, obviously. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, it, not only the actual practicalities of the financial makeup that a, that a family is dealing with, but also the individual hopes and desires for the, the early weeks and months with the baby and ongoing. This really, this is the time to really explore, okay, for the, for the mother, if she, if she is employed and is engaged in a, you know, is part of a career path that is ongoing and unfolding, is that something that she wants to continue? Um, really being honest and, and realistic with both parties, you know, so the, so the mother can bring to the table to her partner, you know what? Yes. My career is incredibly important to me. And in the best case scenario, my, my postpartum period looks like this X, Y, and Z. And then I go back to work or I don't think I want to go back to work. 
you know, a guess. Again, you don't you don't entirely know. There is that space of unknown. I really like to emphasize we, we can only predict so much. Um, but coming to the table with those those thoughts, really, really honest. You know, being being courageous to be as honest as you can with your partner before the baby arrives again is is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And may and I like what you said about maybe not knowing. Because it's so true, like the way you might feel now and your expectation now might be so different once that baby's in your arms. And I think being open to the possibility and acknowledging that with your partner in your relationship that things might change. That's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. I really like that a lot. It's almost planning for the unexpected. Uh Yes, I'd like to factor in a a, a period of, of not knowing. You know, I can't exactly tell you how I'm going to feel until it happens. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, So that's, yeah, all important stuff. And then um, moving on, another big, big issue that's, you know, talked about a lot, I think, in some capacities is, is how will our sex life be affected by the addition of a newborn? And for me, there's sex, but there's also intimacy and there's, it, there's connectedness with your partner. To me, that's all under the same umbrella. How will that shift and how, how much can you predict and what can you bring to the table in those early conversations? Yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts too on that like in interfacing with mothers and whatnot. Is that a topic that comes up a lot? It does somewhat. Um, I also think there's like the medical aspect of that conversation too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think people can talk to their OBGYNs about like certain aspects of the, like the physical side of, of sex and what that means, you know, postpartum. But yeah, no, I like, I like what you're saying about intimacy. I think that in a lot of ways, um, you know, having a baby brings couples so much closer, you know, you're sharing that experience, that bond. It's a different kind of intimacy. It's not better or worse. Yes. I agree with you. And I really like that, like bringing attention to to the actual medical physiological facts of what's happening to a woman's body, in a woman's body after giving birth and after pregnancy. Maybe um, a partner's not completely versed in those. That might be a nice place to start too. So he Mm -hmm. or she is understanding there. And then, um, yeah, I think you may have to me think about something when you were just speaking out. I think that having these conversations before the baby arrives also opens the door to to maybe feeling a bit more courageous or a bit more comfortable to really speak kind of from your heart once the baby has arrived as well. Really being able to say like what feels comfortable and what doesn't feel comfortable and maybe looking at about why or why not together, I think is mm-hmm. really, really nice. Yes. <laughs> Great. And then that brings us to number four, which is how will our social lives change once baby is here? And, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a significant one. There might be some feeling that it's implied that both of you do understand each other and you can make some assumptions, but we really feel that making those assumptions can be a bit dangerous because when, when the actual event takes place and the baby's here and in your lives, you, you might be wrong. So it absolutely does not hurt to, to add that to the list of things you talk about. You know, so if you, you and or your partner have, you know, a robust social life, extracurricular activities, sports are involved in, who knows what, you know, it, is the expectation that those will continue as is, especially for the partner, the support partner, it, or will there be a shift in the early weeks and days? What, what do both parties want and can there be a compromise? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a couple of things that come up. <laughs> I remember going through my birth plan, which I liked calling my birth intentions um, planning with my postpartum doula before my baby arrived. <laughs> she was talking about, you know, what, what? so let's talk about the delivery room, you know, who's going to be there and, and what is that like? And she said, and I'll just remind you, there's a limit on the number of people who can be present. And it just, <laughs> it just made me laugh because, yeah, I guess, you know, there's all kind, there's every color in the spectrum, right? Some people are going to want absolutely no one except their partner and their doctor. 
other people are going to want to pack that room full of friends and family and cameras and videotapes, everything. <laughs> right. Um, and so like on that more social side of the spectrum, like thinking about like how social do you want to be like how soon as well, I think is an interesting consideration, right? Like, do you expect to have your house being sort of a revolving door of people visiting and seeing the new baby like immediately? Does that happen later? Um, and, and yeah, then there's the, so I think that's really interesting. And then also sort of the, the me time aspect of it, right? Like if, if boyfriend or husband or partner is used to playing tennis every Tuesday night, um, are they going to stop that? Are they going to keep doing that? I mean, there's there's an element of it being important that everyone is able to sort of maintain a little bit of their own self care, and if that's part of their self care, then that's you know that's really important. Um, so then the conversation goes to well, how do we accommodate that? How do we make that work? Um, so that all feels really relevant. Uh, yes, and I'm so glad that you that you brought up sort of the the internal at home aspect. Of, of a social life and the external you know, pursuing your, your own own pursuits and activities self-care wise they're they're both part of the conversation for sure absolutely and um for us we really really encourage the expecting mother to get a sense of her own needs and that in a, in and of itself can be a process you know what do i really what do i really want or, or how do i really operate you know, I, there's a piece of me maybe that's pleasing, that's a pleaser or trying to make other people happy. And then there's the piece that's authentically me. And having a baby is no better time than ever to really, really tap into to your truest self. And, and if your truest self does not want acquaintances and friends streaming through your living room in those first weeks with your new baby, it's really okay to say that, to be really clear about it. You can do it in a way that's kind. To be mm-hmm. clear. Mm-hmm. Um, what are what are the options for a social life postpartum? Like, what are what are some of the other like considerations that come up in terms of you and your partner? Yeah, or just I mean, I guess there's like digital social as well. There's lots mm. of ways to stay connected. Ab- absolutely, and so if you are. That makes me think of this the support team that that we really suggest that a, an expecting mother creates for herself mm-hmm. um, to really ensure that that she isn't alone as well, which is the other side of the spectrum, right? That she doesn't feel isolated and and lonely when or if her partner does go back to work or life does resume some of its old shape, you know, to to the degree that it can, um, and a mother's sort of left there with a new baby. It can look so many different ways. Exactly. It could be Skype dates with a friend who lives in another country. It can be check-in texts from a friend. It could be a knock on the door with the understanding that you might not answer from your neighbor. I think it's the idea of opening opening the door to receive support, but knowing that ultimately you're the you're the gatekeeper. Without sounding too too harsh. Like you you're in control. You kind of got your hands on the wheel there, you know, or the gears, how fast or how much you want mm-hmm. to engage socially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. I <laughs> love those four questions. Um, I Thank will, you. I will definitely um, include those on our site as well. So people can reference that. And then I guess I was just curious because you're, you're a second time mom. Like what is your experience with kind of going through relationship changes with first and second or not necessarily your experience, but just in general is the, the you know, any differences that may crop up? Uh, so what comes up thinking about that too, there are differences and obviously life, the shape of your, your family life just continues to expand sort of like this entity that, that has its own life and energy to it. And when you bring another person into the fold, um, obviously it comes with its own set of, of dynamics and, and challenges as well. And so I think it's, again, it's, it's preparation. It's, it's similar conversations that you had before your first baby, but now factoring in your older child, who is going to pick up the older child up from school. Like that would have been great for me. I, I so wish, so simple. 
I so <laughs> wish I had just uh, seriously, Sarah. I cannot believe I didn't do it. Like I so wish I just asked someone at, at my older son's preschool. You know, set up a little team just to have someone help me get him home for those first yeah. few weeks. You know, didn't do it. Would have changed so much for me. So I think simple little things like that. Really looking at um, yeah, what your support team looks like and how to factor in time with the baby, time with the older child, obviously making sure the older child feels, you know, comfortable with the, all these changes that are happening in his or her life as well. Um, I also love to bring up if this is the right time, you can tell me that I want to make sure that we speak to the partner's experience during the first 40 days, kind of just like turn the light to the partner for yeah. a minute or so. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Let's, yeah. yeah. If that's okay. Yeah. It's just so important uh, for all of us, for Han and Emily and I, that, that we, that we loop the partner in as well. It's not just, they don't just have this secondary role. And uh, obviously in those first 40 days, it can feel really, it can feel secondary. Uh, We hear so many stories from spouses and partners that just kind of feel on the outs, not sure how to participate, how to, how to really dive in and how to really support um, their the mother. And I think it, again, bringing attention to that is so important. And while I know that a new mother can feel so overwhelmed, it can feel overwhelming to manage all that you're managing, healing, recovering in your own body, adjusting to this new life, all of that while caring and tending to your new baby and all the challenges that that can or cannot bring up. Maybe you're attempting to breastfeed and get the baby to sleep and all of that. It can seem like a lot to add to that list, you know, paying attention or honoring or respecting your partner's experience. But we figured out that it doesn't have to be hard. Simple, simple, little gestures, little steps and small acknowledgements really go a long way to helping a partner feel involved and important, which ultimately is more fortification for your relationship, the two of you. Uh, Yeah. So that's just something I really want to emphasize. And what are examples of that? Do you mean things like, uh, you know, giving, giving the partner or the spouse practical examples of sort of answering that question, like how to help, how to be there, how to support. um, And, and, you know, you talk about acknowledging and little steps, like what are some examples? Okay. Yes, I have them. (laughs) This is really important. Yeah, this is really important to us. So uh, the, one of the first things that really comes to mind that's sort of prevalent for us is giving your partner space to, to be a parent the way he or she wants to be a parent. So that may mean, like, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say, like, backing off, creating space for, <laughs> right? I think creating, that's okay to say just back off. Is it? Is it? <laughs> yes. You know, you, to have your t- – okay. So, to, yeah, I like that. To back off, to allow – you know, he might not change diapers the way you would change the diaper, you know? And mm-hmm. there's definitely a sense of, of control that can come in with a new mother. So much, pro- so much protecting, right? Even with your, even with the, the, the baby's father or, or partner, right? Your partner, but giving yourself, you know, almost the courage to allow him to, to tend to the baby in a way that feels right for him really gives him some autonomy and some, sense of relevance, I think is incredibly important, keeps you all really looped in together as a family. So just just one example, tending to the baby, rocking the baby the way he feels is right. Obviously, it's not harmful, but just giving him space to do it his way, I think is one. And another really key thing is you might, a new mother might be incredibly, you know, drained or, or feel depleted tired, but even just like looking at your partner, just like catching his eye for a minute, not even a minute, like a second, right? Thank you. If he hands you a glass of water or, you know, touches you on the shoulder and just looking at him and acknowledging him for a minute, you know, you, you matter. Thank you. It counts, you know, is really key. And then one last thing I think is you might be touched out, you know, feel completely, maybe drained of touch because the baby is in your arms or on your boob or whatnot. And, you know, sex might be off the table for you right now, but there's, you still can cuddle. And I think carving out 
dedicated, just snuggle time, whether it's on the couch and your bodies are just touching each other or spooning just for a few minutes in bed before you pass out, just making sure that there is a little pocket of time that's just for the two of you is so beneficial. Mm. Yeah. Right. Because here's Mm -hmm. this person who's, who's so concerned about you and you're so focused on the baby. Um, sort of closing that loop and bringing it back together and and giving that energy a little bit back to him or her as well, just to, just so that they're, yeah, acknowledged. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Acknowledgement and also another big, big word, and this is a big word with Han, just want to throw it in there because I I, I agree so much, is kindness. Mm -hmm. I know it's really simple. It's simple. It's not complex, right? It's just really simple. Don't forget, right? Small kindnesses. Again, that is a gesture. That's a touch on your partner's arm, a little squeeze on his forearm when he, you know, brings you a cup of tea, mm-hmm. anything like that. They really, they, they add up and they become the glue that keeps you together. I really think so. Wow. I like that. And I like what you're saying about, um, I think another word that comes up for me is confidence, making sure that your partner feels confident. Maybe it's not the same way you would do something, but they can feel confident doing that thing, even if it's a little bit different. And that's okay. Mm, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's perfect. Thank you so much. I mean, the last thing I would just want to ask you is if there are any specific stories that you would share about um, that you think would be interesting for people to hear about, you know, how relationship issues have come up and were dealt with for, for other couples, for anyone you may know, if... If we don't have any, that's fine, but just thought I'd throw it out there. Yes. No, thank you for asking. Perfectly. I actually just met with um, a, a, a mother and friend of mine yesterday who inspired me, and I really would like to just bring a bit of her experience very quickly into our our conversation, if I can. Um, she this is a mother of a, a one-year-old and a four-year-old, so they're just getting out of that baby, baby stage. And um, I asked her, she's been married for since her early twenties, you know, now she's in her late thirties and just asking her, how do you do it? You know, I always like to ask couples, you know, how do you, how do you do it? You know, you're in the heart of life with these two young children and trying to make it all work. And she told me that one of the key things they do and that she has awareness around is, is making sure that they don't fall into the trap of a power struggle or, or a, like any sort of power dynamic. And really what that means is sort of like a tallying or keeping score of who's doing what. So I wake up with a baby every night, but what do you do? And really, really trusting that both parties to the best of their abilities in their own unique ways. So her partner goes out and works, um, you know, all day out in an office and then comes home at night, right? And so she's with the kids and just how, how they how they trust that both parties, they're both doing the, the best they can to keep their family system cruising along as it as it is. And also that they can ask though. This doesn't mean you don't you ask for what you need. So instead of kind of a point a finger pointing, you don't dot 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 dot. And I always do a, a very clear request. You know, you know, it would be meaningful if maybe sometimes on the weekend nights you could wake up with the baby, the days you don't mm-hmm. have to go to work. And, and that is like really... a night and day contrast. <laughs> that right? example, I love it. Yeah. Right. And she said that, I was, wow. She said, Marissa, it is really, it is absolutely saving our marriage. She, it makes us do that. She goes that and every, every now and again, we both take time to look at each other really clearly in the eyes and say, you know, thank you for X. And it could be a small gesture, like for the way, or I see the way you dot, 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 dot. I see the way you pay attention to our four-year-old in the mornings, or I just very clear acknowledgement to just really fills up the heart. It's all about fortification, right? How do we fill mm-hmm. up our hearts and, and steady our relationship for the long haul? So I just just thought that was a sweet example, like really trusting in each other, asking for what you need, and then acknowledging the the good things that you do see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And asking, asking in a way that comes from kindness, asking in a way that, that speaks to what, you know, 
such and such would feel good to me, or I, I really miss having this or that in my life. And I would love it if we could figure out a way to, to help make that happen rather than pointing fingers. That's so powerful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Marissa, we've learned so much from you. Thank you. Yeah, Sarah, it was really fun. So happy to talk to you. Thanks again also to all of our Patreon supporters. And again, please sign up for our newsletter and please do share this podcast with any new or expecting parents in your lives. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time on the fourth trimester. You can subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband, Ben, daughter, Penelope, and baby girl, Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again, bicycle man. I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears, you ride around town without any fear. You got your pedals, you got your brakes, you always wear your helmet for safety's sake.